like to welcome you here uh, at, um, at Identified. And I would like to tell you a bit more about what we do uh, with Scala, with data, and uh, that sort of stuff. So uh, my name is Jan. Uh, I work here at Data Team, um, doing a lot of the Scala and, and data processing and data and machine learning and uh, kind of technological level stuff. And um, we use Scala, and that's why we're here to talk about it. So um, I would like you to uh, introduce you Simon. This is uh, our uh, marketing logo for basically what we do for our, you know, uh, for, for the stuff we do with data. And so if you think about it, that's actually Scala powered guy. <laughs> that's the little guy. And there's actually a whole video with it. You can go to our website and there's an animation which is very cool. We have very good uh, ego. Our um, graphic designer is very good. He drew it all himself. That's cool. Okay, so um, Scala. Uh, what are we going to talk about? Uh, this will be mostly about like a higher level overview about what we do here at Identified. Uh, so what kind of problems we solve, uh, how we solve it, what, what is it good for, um, what's like what we use and why Scala is there so important and why is it so good and where it brings us. Okay. So the product, basically what we do, right? So uh, what we do is that, well, let me show you. This is what we do. <laughs> kind of. Uh, it's mostly a search. It's, it's about uh, surfacing the, the right people to, to, the right, uh, to the right audience. So it's, it's an HR product. So, well, there's actually a better screenshot here for that. So <laughs> you can go and, and you can search for, for candidates. It's, uh, so, you know, in a way, it's kind of, uh, it's one part of what, what LinkedIn uh, offers. Although uh, LinkedIn is uh, showing only the LinkedIn data, whereas uh, we have access to uh, much more data, um, especially uh, a lot of uh, Facebook profiles, and we're also uh, getting data from other sources, and we're all merging that and, and uh, showing that combined. So the main product is basically, is basically a search type of thing. And so, as you can imagine, if you get uh, profiles from Facebook, uh, people write their different, different jobs and, and uh, you know, different noise. So what we need to do with all that is, uh, so in order to, you know, find people and find really everybody and, and everywhere, which is, you know, which is kind of the, the mission what we do, we need to get all the data, we need to clean them, you know, to, to, to normalize them, to say that, you know, different things really mean the same thing. You know, like even the locations, even, you know, somebody says, I live in SF, you know, somebody else says, you know, San Francisco and, and whatnot. So uh, we need to, you know, put them, or put, put, give it all, you know, like right meaning, put it into right boxes, although it's not really boxes and we don't really know how many of them they are and whatnot. So we need to merge it into such entities and, uh, and then, uh, of course, um, hopefully fill in, fill in the blanks because uh, if you have more uh, resources or if you have social graph, then there's a lot of things which we can just figure out, even though people don't say that immediately. And of course, turn it into a product. So that's actually where the door starts. You know, you go from, from the last line back. But this is pretty much the same for, for all the data companies. So it kind of sounds like ETL, only except it's not because uh, you need to do a lot of stuff. It's not just you know, simply throwing like, s select where something, not now. It's quite a bit more involved. Hmm. That's a uh, not so nice picture of our architecture. Uh, it's kind of, so the important part is that basically, uh, so I will focus only on some parts of the architecture for you know, obvious reasons. So, um, there are applications and mobile applications and whatnot, which are and, and third-party data, which we are some of that we're scraping, some of that we're getting, you know, somehow. Um, we integrate all that in Hadoop, obviously, because that's the that's the best thing for that, because you can store there anything you you have, and you can process it. So you can use Hadoop as an archive, as you know, processing everything. That's where we run all our uh, data processing, machine learning, and and whatnot. 
And we output, our primary output from Hadoop goes to solar, because as you saw, it's a primarily a search product, basically. It's a search engine, very dedicated and very specialized. And so uh, most of the product goes to, most of the output goes to solar uh, in order to be served in, in web application. And uh, we also use solar there basically as a you know, like key value store. So basically kind of most of the data we need goes to solar. There's also some Postgres, Redis, and a few other things. Um, so um, yeah, also uh, the web application, that's you know, again another thing which I won't cover. Um, it's very cool. Um, it's very well done. We have great people working on it, but it's not Scala, so you're probably not the right audience. However, if you're interested in you know Ruby and, and JavaScript slash CoffeeScript type of things we're doing here, uh, I would like to invite you to some of our other meetups uh, so you can learn more about that there. So uh, what I would like to, to talk about, basically, and kind of you know put emphasis on, um, is uh, one of the things is, is actually a, a, a data pipeline and uh, how do you treat the data? Because uh, it actually, you know, when you do machine learning, I don't know what's your experience. So whom, whom of you is doing actively machine learning or really data, data science, data pro like really something heavy to with data? Yeah. I think you all will agree with me that basically getting data into the right shape is really important, and that having spreadsheets around and and you know text lines of various different format on every single line and not UTF-8 encoding and whatnot, that's probably not the way to go, right? Because you'll never ever do anything sexy because you'll just waste your time on, on stupid things. So for that reason, um, I think even with, with uh, uh, our colleagues and you know our next speakers, we will agree that Avro is actually the best solution out there. Uh, uh, and I think you should all really consider that uh, for, for your applications. Because um, whatever it is, it's a, it's a serialization format. It's a way, uh, it gives you schemas and it gives you principles on which to evolve schemas, which are ridiculously simple. It's just if you create a new field, just give it a default value. And therefore, you don't break the readers which were written before. And you know, it, so it works. So, you know, and don't rename fields and you know like basically few things you can you can say them yourself without actually reading that it's just you know just be sane and that's it but it helps you to even even check that and it integrates very well with um, uh, Hadoop infrastructure and um, quite a few other things so that's that's great about it and if you do like what we do with that is <clears throat> we create a one repository which basically, so even even the teams working in Ruby, they are free to you know create new schema. They easily can create new schema. They just put the schema into repository. It builds for the you know Java slash Scala. Well, well, actually, it's not Java. We're not doing Java anymore, right? It's just Scala. Okay, so uh, so it builds it builds for us the uh, the uh, sources. So then we have you know type safe. We know we get a we get a feed, so let's say you know log from that search engine, you know like log, and I just get it, and I just type dot in my IDE, and you know it tells me okay, hey, you have here a timestamp which is in the milliseconds, and it's long, and and whatnot, and it helps you a lot. It's it tremendously speed up your uh, your development, and so I would highly suggest you all do either that or something very similar. Then the other part important for that is uh, is Kafka. So basically, when you generate the streams, and I mean everything. So even even our uh, crawlers, when we crawl some some sources, you know, like really crawling some websites, we also generate that as a as a as a raw streams of data. But it's again, you know, typed. We know that it was crawled by by which node, uh, at what time. Um, what was the response, the, the raw body, what was the headers, and, and everything. So we can go back and figure out that there was maybe something wrong with our crawler or maybe with our parser. We need to reparse the data. And uh, we don't have to put the load again on our uh, partners that we are scraping them yet again. So that's, uh, that's very, that was very useful for us. 
And so uh, what Kafka gives you, I guess you may have heard about it because it's written in Scala. <laughs> so um, what it gives you is basically a simple uh, publishing, uh, simple you know, uh, publish subs subscribe th type of thing. Um, it works with very large volumes, and the important thing is that it parses the data in between to the disk, and it's writing the, that sequentially. So basically, you have no problem with access uh, with the, with I/O and whatnot, and uh, and you can subscribe to those feeds, and you can write one job which you subscribe all the topics which are running, and you don't actually have to write it because LinkedIn guys has already written that, so <laughs> you can just use it. And you can subscribe automatically all the topics and throw them into Hadoop. So you can emphasize within your organization that uh, every possible data stream you ever may want to use for whatever kind of fancy stuff you want to do, um, it gets created easily, it has nice schema, and uh, it gets persisted for you, it gets stored, so you can take it, you can grab it, you can work with it. So I think that's really, really useful. And then we get to Hadoop, right? So we, we generated the data, we have them in a nice form, they're coming to Hadoop. So what we can do in Hadoop with them, we can write Hive, of course, for simple queries. It's great, I think. Beating SQL in, SQL in simple queries is, I believe, not really easy. Um, I love Scala and a lot of things around it, but I still write some SQL queries because it's just easy. And for the rest, we use Scalding. Uh, whom of you here have used Scalding? One, two, three. Yeah, okay, guys, of course. <laughs> um, Scalding, no? Okay, whom of you have heard about Scalding? Okay, that's actually a lot. That's good, okay. So let's make it quicker. So, uh, so Scalding, well, that will be anyway covered by, uh, by the next speakers. So Scalding, uh, Scalding is a, is a Java DSL. It's just a thing where you express the whole computation. It's not really MapReduce specific, specific, although I'm not sure if it's compiling currently into anything else. But it's a, it's a way to capture your, uh, um, your computation into basically a graph. And so eventually you can compile it down into other things hopefully maybe one day in future, I don't know. Um, anyway, the important thing is that it's, um, it's pretty, uh, pretty well, it's, it's, uh, and even more important is that it's growing very well, so there's really good community around it. So um, for cascading, there's Scalding, which is the Scala DSL, which is probably, well, I believe really the best way to write Hadoop jobs these days. Um, it's written by Twitter. It's actually really good. It's actually one of the better things from Twitter. Uh, it's, uh, it's open sourced. It's, um, it's working very well. Um, by the way, uh, cascading is the same thing that powers quite a bit of other things. Uh, uh, like, for example, the closure guys, what they're using, that's again some thin wrapper DSL kind of thing on, 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 uh, on top of uh, cascading. Uh, and so uh, the good thing is that uh, there are actually multiple communities, not just the Scalding community, but there's a lot of users in, in, in Java, there's a lot of users in, in uh, Clojure and basically all across you know, JVM and all across the uh, Hadoop uh, uh, ecosystem, there are people who are writing jobs and, and writing libraries which works well, integrates well uh, with uh, Cascading. And there is a power in that. So, that's good. The other options um, uh, in Scala, I don't know if you've heard of them, Scrunch and Scooby. Um, they both have their advantages and as well as disadvantages. Uh, so Scrunch is, the main advantage is that it's, it's done by Cloudera, which is generally very good engineering, and it's Apache project. So those are the two advantages. But it's basically the same thing as cascading, and uh, Scrunch is just a thin wrapper on top of Crunch, which is a Java library. And um, it's, it's way less advanced than, than Scalding. So nice to try, but not really, not, not really that good. At least not at the time being. Uh, and Scooby, Scooby is really nice. It's pure Scala, you know, unlike Scalding. Scalding is this, you know, Java thing. So some Scala people don't like it uh, because it's not Scala. I myself don't really care because I use the tools which works. 
so <laughs> which <laughs> which uh, helps me to get where, where I need to get, and so that's why scaling. Um, so scaling, I don't know if you've seen this kind of things. Um, uh, I'll let it uh, to uh, to the, to, the, uh, to our next speakers uh, to talk more about uh, to talk more about uh, scaling uh, because they probably even know it better than me. Uh, anyway, I showed you an example because I believe they will not show it. It's let me show you. It's two slides, and it's actually a pretty simple thing. Uh, because I don't want to lie to you, <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm showing you two things which you normally don't see. You typically see these screenshots of you know like huge, my previous job in Java, or where there is if you actually look carefully at it, half of it is just imports. So unlike the other people, I included the imports. So this is uh, the actual whole file. Oh, sorry, the package is missing there. Uh, by the way, this thing is from the uh, from a project which I should open. So I should have open sourced it already. It's my uh, like a test bed for you know various Hadoop stuff, and I've implemented there kind of the same workflow in Pig, Hive, uh, uh, Scooby, Scrunch, Scalding, uh, Plain Java, Plain Scala, and so that's why I can tell you that Scalding is really the best. <laughs> Um, and also Cascalog, you know, the closure thing. So, you know, um, so I will actually open source it sooner or later. Uh, hopefully within a week, I, I would like to do it uh, at the beginning of next week. So you can then actually look at that and, and really run it because there are even integration tests for all that stuff and um, it just runs, you know, Maven package and that's it. So I'll then post it on the on the meetup group. Um, anyway, what what... What are the other things uh, to see here, which may and may not be covered in the next talk, is uh, this is showing the typed pipe, which may not look that sexy on the slides because it's, uh, it's a little bit more verbose, but it gives, you the, uh, it gives you better code completion and everything because everything's uh, checked. So there are two things, um, fields API in, in Scalding and types, uh, typed pipe. And uh, fields API is kind of a thing where you bind based on names. So, um, so that's, uh, that's making it a little bit more annoying, although it's not that much annoying. You can actually uh, totally freely use it very easily because if you run it at the beginning, it has to compile your job and it figures out that those names don't match. So it's, it's not in the middle of running your Hadoop job. It's actually before you start it. So uh, it's actually pretty okay to use that. But this is, this is better once you write more jobs. This is better that uh, it will tell you, um, uh, it will basically tell you if you have more jobs, you change something, uh, your ID goes red wherever it needs to and you don't even have to do anything. So you already, you, you immediately within a split of a second, you know what you're making wrong. Okay, uh, back to this job, what is it doing? Basically two, str uh, two streams in Avro, one is requests, one is actions, and it's uh, outputting, so basically it needs to join them based on some ID which is in both requests and, uh, and, and store it. So um, basically those, those uh, three lines here are defining uh, two input files, one output file. The last line down there, lazy val, the lazy is important. Uh, that's basically a service which does, you know, some geolocation based on IP address to make a country. Uh, just to make it interesting, because then when you're comparing different frameworks, uh, well, not the Scala frameworks, but I mean the um, pig and hive, then, you know, as you know, UDFs are kind of pain in the ass. Um, this is a way to, to make, a, in type pipe, to, to make a join. So basically, first you need to you need to group it by something. So basically, you have to you have to somehow tell it uh, what's the what's the key uh, based on which to group, uh, or based on which to join. Then you can join it, and then um, you know usual stuff like count, map, and whatnot. Um, anyway, I would encourage you to to uh, give that a try. If you want to give it a try, like next week, I'll try to Monday uh, push this out with uh, all the integration tests, and you can compare it with uh, Big Hive, you know, whatever you want to. Uh, other than that, I won't go much deeper because I'm pretty sure it will be covered in the next talk. Um, just a few notes for you uh, who are not using it because it's so cool that you should definitely 
start using it. So let me uh, help you a bit with a few notes. I kind of see our problems for uh, for people, which were a problem, big problem even for me to get started with that. So um, yeah, first I would like to thank Chris here over there to for for, for helping with this. Uh, basically, he did a little piece of work there compared to the rest of the things, but also very very useful for us because we love Avro and he did the Avro integration. <laughs> um, Big thing I would like to warn you about and try to explain you a bit because I haven't heard it myself and I've heard about scaling first myself on a, on a meetup, right? And I haven't got that and it cost me quite a lot of time. Is the serialization stuff. So um, let me show you in the code. So what you can see here, you know, what, what to be there, if you, if you look even at some examples running, take a note of this, you know, the meat locker thing here, which, as I told to Chris, it's for this Avro thing uh, in particular. Uh, once newer version is released, you don't really need to do that. But that's for the Avro thing only. So if you actually look at that, uh, okay, it's now a little pity that it's not on one slide. But if you look at that, okay, so it's one class. So if you forget the imports, there's one class, okay, and there's this. So. What scaling does for you um, is that it somehow packages that and give it to cascading. And what cascading does is, uh, so if, if you look at that, it looks, uh, it looks like it's run somewhere on one node. But that's not exactly true, right? It has, to, it has to take your job and execute something as a map tasks, something as reduced tasks across vast um, number of machines, right? Across a lot of machines. So that means, that some of this code get executed in map tasks, some of them in reduced tasks, and something get executed also where you start the job, right? So think about it as, as a client, somewhere where you're submitting the job. Where you're submitting the job, it creates the pipeline, it creates all these things, well, it kind of creates kind of everything. It has to create a pipeline. Okay, let me go back to the, to the other slide. It has to create this pipeline and give it to cascading so it knows how to plan it that okay it will compile into you know maybe two map reduce jobs and and um, and uh, what will be the input what will be the output you know and all, all, all the all the details but in in order for, for that to happen it has to so you, you give it something at the beginning. You give it these, these things at the input. You take the arguments. Maybe you do something with it. Maybe you uh, compute something. Maybe you just append a path or whatever. Now, the important thing is that you have to serialize all this thing. You have to serialize that to put it somewhere to deliver it to those mappers or reducers. And that's by far, at least it was for me and for uh, other people I, I've spoken with, uh, this is the biggest part if you actually try to start using it yourself, that's, that's pain. Uh, because serialization, um, there are methods how to put in serialization, and there are even some problems with that uh, with, within cascading. Uh, in particular, for me, it just didn't work. I spent a lot of hours, more than a normal day on it, and then I gave up. Um, so the way to do that is, uh, what I would suggest you to do are two things. First. Start with working example. Second, uh, lazy val everything, even though here at the beginning of the three, it's probably not that, uh, it should not matter there. Uh, but lazy val definitely saves, saves the third guy, kind of my uh, thing that I need, like, uh, that's like ETL, right? That's some job which somehow loads the database of IP addresses and then, you know, translate it using some libraries and whatnot. Uh, point is, if I make it lazy val, it's not actually a value, it's not a field within that class. It doesn't have to be serialized, it's just a method. And those guys who need it, so in particular in this case, it's called in, in, uh, in what will be compiled into a reducer. Uh, that guy can uh, just call this method, you know, first time, lazy will get initialized, okay, and then it's, it's, it's returned. So basically, all the serialization problem is, is solved because you know how to initialize it. So that's good. And f but for some parts, uh, namely here the, uh, the, the Avro source, because Avro has its schemas and whatnot, and it's not defined as serializable in, in uh, uh, like a serializable like Java, what is it, java.io.serializable, or you know, the, the, the interface, uh, then it doesn't work with the default. 
uh, luckily for us, Chris has fixed that, but unfortunately it's not released, so uh, kind of thing uh, to work around that and work around other possible issues. If you see that something can't get serialized, Meatlocker is pretty neat thing, another library from uh, Twitter. Uh, it's using um, it's using Creo for serialization. Um, it doesn't really matter. It just serializes the things. Um, uh, anyway, you should not need that all that much. Basically, make sure the easiest way is to make the lazy valves. Whatever you need inside your map procedures and kind of everywhere, just make it lazy val and and you'll be fine. And if you have all the data in a jar file, or if you need some some files in order to process that, just put that to distributed cache and initialize it as a lazy well and you know now read from the distributed cache. That's well documented in Scaling, you'll find that, so no, no problem with that. And with that, it works like a charm. It's very nice, very easy to write, very easy to work with. Um, yeah. And plus there's quite a bit more things coming in the, in the Scaling ecosystem which I haven't seen not even a tiny fraction of, of that activity within uh, Scooby or, or, um, or Scrunch. So, so at least for the foreseeable future, go with Scalding. Okay. Um, okay, so we, we have covered so far, uh, you know, how we get the data, how we form them in Avro and whatnot, uh, and why, you know, that's the important thing that helps you do all the stuff done easier. Gets to Hadoop. In Hadoop, primary, you know, really pr heavy processing is, is, is in Scalding. Uh, any questions to that? No? Not yet? Good. Um, so, next big thing, before I dive into kind of some problems and how we solve them in terms of machine learning, is about solar and Lucene. And that's actually, you know, well, I mean, partially, you know, like, most of the part, if you're a data scientist, uh, but you spend most of the time, at least at least the guys I, I've spoken to, you spend most of the time either pre preparing presentation if you're that kind of data scientist, or you spend most of your time, um, like the low level non-machine learning kind of like cleaning and then filtering, preparing data basically. Um, or you are doing, I don't know what, but you claim to be machine, uh, to be data scientist just because everybody does these days. Anyway, uh, Lucene Solar, um, slash Elasticsearch, slash a few other technologies, um, is the leading, uh, is the leading um, search, uh, full text search engine, right? Um, as you saw, our primary uh, product is the search, basically. It's specialized search. So we're using heavily uh, solar and Lucene. Uh, in particular, Solar Cloud for uh, for the for serving the 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 end stuff, and uh, so if you don't know the relation, uh, basically Solar is uh, is a web service, uh, whereas uh, Lucene is the actual library which is actually doing the heavy lifting. So, uh, but you can do a lot of, a lot more with that than than just pure um, uh, pure search engine. Because uh, among other things, you can do with that. Uh, so one thing is the is the search engine. The other thing is that it's it's actually a pretty good uh, key value store. Well, it's actually a really good key value store. It's actually pretty much like you know HBase or Cassandra or whatever. So for us currently, although we need to generate a lot of stuff and we need to serve them somehow, we still haven't installed any you know Cassandra or HBase or or these kind of guys just because. Since we already have solar, it's just easier to administer one system, and it just works even if you throw you know more data to it. And um, you know you can query it based on you know primary ID. So basically, it gives you you know what you have with HBase and Cassandra as well. So, uh, but it's great for other stuff as well. So um, because we're working a lot with the with the text. Uh, you know, even so, when we when we get the user profiles and when we look at uh, their locations, uh, I mean, in text form, uh, as well as if we look at their um, uh, education and and job history and whatnot, uh, it's all text. It's it's mostly text, but there's a lot of you know 
subtle details. Uh, people type things like they, they do some, you know, like uh, even if, so, like you can't compare two strings at all because uh, because you know there's like case sensitivity and whatnot, and so sure you can you can lowercase and 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 uh, strip uh, and trim the white spaces. That's the easiest thing. But then there's a lot of different uh, ways how you can um, express one document, uh, one 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 name of even name of an, an entity. Like you know, like think of like universities. How many how many different names they have? There's Berkeley. There's University of Berkeley, University of California of Berkeley, and like uh, and Cal, and you know, like gazillion of things. So this is actually one of the ways where uh, if you try to actually put that into one thing, that's actually where uh, search engine already came very handy. And uh, other things, what is it good for is that um, you need to do more things. Um, so for example, uh, you want to do some, some spell checking, right? And so now you need some spell checking library and whatnot. Kind of the one in Lucene is just you know perfect. It's just better than anything else. Or you want uh, finite uh, uh, state automatas uh, for things like um, you know Levenstein distance or 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 whatnot. That's also you know very useful because you can correct spelling mistakes and whatnot and like shrink down the number of your unique um, unique names of you know either people or companies or whatever. You can considerably shrink that down, which is very useful for later stages of, of uh, some processing. You know. Um, and you can go a long, long way if you do some custom, uh, custom if you store some custom fields and 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 you do custom uh, scoring. Um, I don't know if you've done uh, a, lo a lot of it. Have have anybody worked a lot on search problems? No. Uh, one, two, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Basically, you can you can store a lot of fields. So, for example, things which are useful for us is, uh, is uh, things like uh, you store a size of a, of a company, even though you don't display it, right? But do you search for something? You know, like let's say you search for Google with you know not two O's, but you know three O's, for example. And you know what? Let's say there's such company exist in the world. We actually saw it in our data set, <laughs> but it's a different story. But the point is that uh, you know if. If you see that you have a lot of users with Google, exactly Google, if you store uh, you know, this, this field about the size of the company, it's a very good indicator for you that that's the right company people are looking for. That they are probably not looking for that exact match, but they're probably looking for this pretty close match uh, because that's you know, the very one known and, 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 and whatnot. So you're actually getting better result, better product if you, if you do that. And you know that's that itself is like huge topic how to how to do you know searching and scoring scoring best that's that's um, I don't know how many how many thousand people of very smart people work on that in Google but and we're not that smart but you know anyway uh, this talk is not about search so um, not that but uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's it's very helpful when you work for text it's it's more than just search. Uh, one of the things which is really useful for us are those uh, uh, new uh, the, the automatas, which were vastly improved in, in Solar 4. And actually, if you're using the, the search of any kind, use Solar 4 or Lucene 4. Or if you're using Elasticsearch, upgrade to Solar 4, you know, Lucene 4. It's way much better. And ideally, keep with the latest version. Um, what you can do with those uh, uh, automatons there is, uh, so for example, if you produce something, so, you know, so things like so you need to work with so we have we have something like uh, 700 800 uh, well it's I believe 800 now right 800 million uh, million uh, users uh, and even more you know with you know history of jobs and 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 education and whatnot uh, so you would for example like to do something with it like you know like typical you know machine learning you know people will go like okay let's you know so typical algorithms, you know, used with working with data are things like you know clustering and like, and then and, and uh, well, regression of course, right? Linear regression, logistic regression, and then you know some trees and you know this and that. Um, the biggest problem with that is uh, like we would love to, we would really love to cluster those things, for example, 
But most of the times, uh, just the clustering is, is, is a problem. I mean, how do you cluster on the text? There's this thing about clustering that uh, you need to have some distance function. And uh, it seems easy for people to do that, but it's pretty difficult to do for, for machines. And one of great ways to, to help with that are uh, finite state uh, automat uh, automatas, where you basically, you can match the, uh, the library in Lucene works very well that it creates very compact, very fast uh, automata by, you just give it, you just give it a, you give it a set of, a set of words and it can, uh, it just creates uh, automata which very quickly match and tells you, okay, it match or it does not match. And you can very quickly say, hey, you know, build me this with, you know, Levenstein distance, uh, this and that. Or you can say that uh, instead of um, uh, automata, you can uh, do the transducer, which you can say that basically assign some values to the edges. And so in the end of the, uh, in the end of the, uh, end of the matching, you can say that you have something that, um, some value which was accumulated uh, when traversing around the path within, within the automaton. And it helps us quite a bit with, uh, with a few things. So um, that's, what, uh, that's what we use uh, Solder Lucene for. We use it a lot actually. We even em embed it for quite a few things. We even embed it in, in Hive jobs, like we create small indices, um, very specialized indices, which we embed into, into map tasks. So, you know, in scaling, it's just it's the same way if, as there was initialized this, this little thing. There's another thing which initialized, you know, uh, solar. Um, uh, not solar, but Lucene, the, the library itself. And um, then we can, you know, basically run a map task and we can look at every single user and we can through, you know, a uh, couple of steps, which basically is decision tree, kind of figuring out, okay, you know, is it helpful, is it not helpful? Are we confident enough that we know really something about it? Maybe not. And that's, that's very powerful. Um, the other big thing, which is very useful for us, is, is clustering. Uh, it's very useful to cluster the users based on anything you want to, <laughs> anything you can, I would say. Um, for good or bad, for us, um, we don't have that many numbers about people, which is a pity because um, mostly the clustering is, is really easy if you have numbers. It's pretty easy to define some distance <laughs> based on some, some number of vectors. If you have mostly text, it's pretty big problem. It's kind of not, not really, you know, things like uh, k-means spectral clustering or whatever. From any kind of clustering I've ever heard about, you have to define of some similarity. Okay, not, not really. For min hash, you define some hashes, and so it's not exactly the truth. But you know, uh, even for the other other ways of clustering, anyway, it's kind of hard. And in the end of the day, we we would basically love to cluster kind of everybody. I mean, after all, search is. If you think about search, you can think about it as a as a problem where you would you would cluster everybody with the right set of words, right? Whatever you enter on, on, on Google, it's just a cluster with some pages. <laughs> hmm. uh, anyway, uh, it's great for locations. Um, so we can cluster uh, users uh, based on location, and then we can look at, at specific groups. Um, you know, the, the other stuff, we know about it. So the clustering by itself for us don't solve that much, but it helps us a lot to say that something those people have uh, in common. But we need to integrate it with, with other stuff. So um, that other stuff is, for example, social graph, right? Because it's very useful to know about those people that they are geographically uh, in about the same area. OK, well, it's definitely useful to cluster those people based on a few obvious things like you know, age and, and gender and whatnot. I'm not even talking about it in terms of clustering because that's kind of ob obvious. It's like you don't even, you probably, you're better off just bucketing people into that than just, you don't need to discover clusters in that. I mean, you, you know already that that does something reasonable and you can put it into few buckets without any algorithm actually. But the social graph is, is another very, very useful thing uh, what is mostly useful is that uh, 
a lot of people, uh, a lot of the a lot of the profiles, a lot of the data we have, uh, for example, from Facebook, especially, uh, people put there a lot of noise, or they don't put their things and whatnot. And so what we are able to do is we can look at the friends, right, and start getting information from friends. So we can start making assumptions, of course, with not 100%, but we can start making some assumptions about, um, especially your location, that's relatively the one where you can get quite a, uh, quite a bit of confidence easily. Uh, on the other hand, there are problems uh, other with that. Um, uh, some, things, some things are not working all that well with the, with the social graph. Especially the biggest problem is that uh, we don't have all that uh, dense graph as Facebook itself has. So we have to really watch carefully about how many friends we have for you. Because, you know, if you have very little friends, then it's quite often pretty random connection. You go somewhere for vacation to other part of the world, and <laughs> you make a connection there with somebody which is, you know, who is totally unrelated to you at all. So, um, but it helps. It helps a lot. And it helps then, when, especially once you can, can, once you can join it with, uh, with the data you've clustered. And that's the hard part. And it's the biggest hard part, and that's the core of what we are working now, is joining different insights, even from within one data set. And even more challenging it is to join from the other data sets. And so that's what we're working on primarily now, or we're trying to really improve and do better. And uh, there's a lot we can do. Uh, there's not that much we've done already. But that's, the, that's the exciting part. That's what I can work on. Not what I can, but I will work again tomorrow. <laughs> so that's the good part. Um, so there are problems. Um, you know, um, I think you've heard or definitely think about the problems. Like uh, you have different user profiles from you know, different, different sites. How do you merge them, right? So of course. You start looking at it, and you have a lot of um, uh, a, lo a lot of simple things like, okay, well, if the name is totally different, then you know it's probably not that not that guy. But you know, if the name is the same, that totally doesn't mean it's it's any any related to that. And um, so it's that's pretty hard. We have quite a few ideas what to do with that. Like we're doing some stuff, but currently we don't have all that all that great um, all that great results. But it's improving, and among other things, for example, you know, we'll bring in more machine learning type of things like um, like topic modeling from posts. We believe should help a lot. That can be easily clustered and you know tell that you have something in similar with people. Then if you look into social graph, uh, you know, to 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 see so like you know geolocation and 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 topic modeling about what are your interests, what you're talking about, what do you like on on Facebook, what do you tweet on on Twitter, and and the things. So those those are the things that that are coming. What we're trying to do, and we're pretty confident that it will help us a lot. So what's the actual machine learning? Where is it? <laughs> So, quite frankly, it's not that much custom written. It's uh, mostly what we use currently. It's Mahout uh, and some R. Um, and so the custom code uh, in this part of stuff is um, mostly, you know, what's, what's your similarity, what's your scoring function, and how to merge maybe a bit more data. But it's, you know, mostly Mahout, Mahout as, a, as, a, as a library. and um, that's what we mostly do. Uh, lately, over the last couple of weeks, we've uh, finally st uh, started focusing on Spark, uh, especially for the iterative algorithms. So we had some ideas, like to kind of put a lot of st of, of stuff into into Spark and like run it for even analytics type of stuff, like you know have queries. Problem with that is that it needs a lot of memory, so that's not that good, and so. We're not doing that, but for the iterative algorithms, uh, it's definitely great, and it's 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 very easy. It's totally trivial for us to, to get started with that, you know, to, to do that. So we're flipping some jobs to that, and uh, it's great. 
for the iterative stuff, especially. You know, so we use scalding. So actually, all of our computations, if you think about that from, from the very beginning, from even, even the large data sets which came from scraping the data, uh, there's, a, there's a Hadoop job which transforms this large collection into something reasonable, which have you know higher ve uh, value. It's smaller, it has higher value. But we keep the steps, we can always recompute that. You can think of it in, in terms of Scala, you can think of that as a, as a function transforming one value, one immutable uh, collection into another immutable collection. That gets persisted and uh, this is actually another important thing for us because um, uh, a lot of those things are, are relatively small, so we want to rerun just some parts of the, uh, of the computation uh, more often and some parts only once in a while. Uh, I mean, especially the things where we run, for example, the uh, Lucene queries for you know, every single user and we run a couple of them, or many of them, because it goes through the, through the decision tree and like, do we trust it enough? Eh, no, not. So, you know, we do another query and whatnot. Um, that's very expensive, so that's really not kind of a thing which we could run quickly. I mean, we can run quickly, we run it quickly. If we add a new user, we can rerun all that very easily. But as we learn more insight from our data and we change our models or we change you know, the, this index and whatnot, then basically we don't know the way back. We don't know to say, if we modify you know, our, our model, how we treat the data, we don't know which users in influence, unfortunately. So we have to rerun on, on all of them and that's pretty expensive, and so that's why it's great that we can persist uh, different steps of, of the computation and then just put it together, which is nothing else than just another job, which, you know, in the end of the day, there's another job which just, you know, send it to um, uh, mostly solar, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, Postgres. But Spark, for the machine learning, especially for the iterative stuff, uh, when you know you shrink it down into some reasonable uh, size, and you know that now basically you burn your course because you're going to you know a couple hours run or you know like hopefully less uh, run your al algorithm on something, that's perfect, and so that's our next big thing we're doing uh, in like big way. Also, I don't know if you said a couple of you that you're using scaling. Just kidding. There was a pattern library from them. I don't know. I haven't tried it yet, but it would be cool. Sounds cool. Uh, some machine learning stuff. Seems like pretty basic stuff. But it would be great, you know, if it integrates with, with the rest of the stuff. That would be that would be also great. And so uh, where is the Scala? I haven't shown you all that much code, have I? Uh, well, uh, the reason for that is fairly simple. Uh, because, uh, so Scala is kind of everywhere. Yes, uh, Scala is kind of uh, everywhere uh, except the web application, basically. And, um, uh, well, actually, except web application and, and scripts for our infrastructure. That's also written in Ruby. It's actually very nice. We have very nicely scripted the entire infra infrastructure, but that's for some different talk. Um, uh, what Scala is doing is um, it's used at, um, uh, as a data team. It's uh, basically like the biggest part of the code, which I haven't spoken about at all, which is doing actually a lot of stuff. It's actually the real-time part of, of Simon, of that, you know, of that, uh, of that guy. Um, all the real-time stuff, all the, so, you know, the, the important stuff is what we, what we do kind of in, in um, uh, what we do in, in Hadoop and what not, that's the thing, what we recompute with all the users, that's wh where we learn new models, that's where we uh, apply new models to all the data we have. But then there's a real-time aspect of it. Even in order to search for that, we need to, whatever is coming from user, what they're searching for and what's their context, what we know about those users, what they can be searching for, you know, like their location and whatnot. Uh, we first need to pre-process that uh, in order to know what we're actually, uh, what we actually want to query, uh, and also as new users are are joining, we also need to, you know, we don't want to wait. As I said, you know, it 
takes us quite some time to apply all, all the machinery. Uh, so we, of course, don't want to wait. If, if you join today, we don't want to tell you, hey, come next week. That doesn't make sense, right? So there's actually a lot of a lot of code which which is uh, which is a um, which is a web service uh, of of the data team which is exposed to the application teams. Um, that's uh, I believe there's like 50 lines of, of Java and everything else is Scala, and uh, these 50 lines are runtime annotations. Do you know guys how to write runtime annotations so it's seen by Java reflection? Because if so, I would I could claim it's 100% Scala, but. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, that's a detail. Um, and then you know all the all the jobs. Um, I mean, it would be interesting to to do in in, in some talk. I show that, but uh, I haven't shown uh, the uh, uh, the way how we compute. You know, all uh, different metrics and whatnot, because that's kind of pretty bound to our data, to our like data structures we use, and it's. Uh, I actually first put it to slides, but it's like ripped off out of, out of the context, and it doesn't make much much sense. You know, uh, things how you because it depends on how, how you compute or similarity. For example, depends heavily on you know like okay, what's your input like? What's 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 your input vector and what's inside and what does it mean and what not and like so it's it's not that easy to present. That would itself take a whole talk, but maybe next time, if you wish. Okay, thank you.